Lord. The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of God's Word to John chapter 17. <coughs> John chapter 17, we'll be reading verses 1 through 11 there. John chapter 17, beginning there with verse 1. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them. And they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf, I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, may we hear what you would have us to hear. Lord, that we may do what you call us to do, that we may be the people, Lord, you call us to be. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, when, when I was growing up on Sunday mornings, we didn't go to church. Instead, we went to Ma's house. Ma was my mom's mom, my maternal grandmother. And depending on what time we kind of got stirring around, we may show up at Ma's house at 10, it might be closer to 11. Uh, but we, it was always sort of the same routine. We'd show up, uh, Mama would sit around the table, talk to Ma. My uncle Kevin, if he got there, he went in the living room, turn on the console television and watch NASCAR. But for me, the thing that I was always excited about, Ma got the Sunday paper. And in the Sunday paper were full colored section of the comics, the funny pages. And it didn't matter which strips were in there. Uh, they'd move them around every so often. But always, the first one at the top, can you guess what it was? Peanuts. Always peanuts. I love peanuts, Charlie Brown and the gang. If you go in my office, in fact, you'll find a, a sort of a coffee table. And there's on it a book with paintings of Jesus. There's one of the history of this church. There's a book on astrophysics if you're really bored and would like to come by and read that. Uh, but there's also a collection of comics from the Peanuts, from Charles Schultz. One of my favorites uh, that I can remember every time I read this passage, uh, it's about Linus and Lucy. Linus is sitting on the floor watching TV, and Lucy comes in and says, change the channel. And Linus says, well, what in the world? Who are you? By what authority do you come in here telling me to change the channel? And Lucy, in the one little box, she holds up her hand, she says, you see these five fingers? Individually, they're nothing. But when I curl them together, <laughs> she says, they make a fist, a weapon that is terrible to behold. And the next box, Linus says, what channel do you want to watch? <laughs> right after that, he looks at his own hand. Why can't you guys get organized like that? You know, I, I think we have a tendency to think like Lucy sometimes when it comes to the church. I think the world has sort of told us that's how things ought to go. Individually, we're nothing, but together, 
That's what matters. Then we can be a force to be reckoned with. Then we're a voting block. Then we're a demographic. Then we're a social group, right? Just lump them all in there together. Together. That's what it means. We've been sort of persuaded to believe that's true. That what's important is that we're all moving in the same direction. That we're all, all, that we're all alike, really. That we all have to be the same. And the problem with that today, maybe more than ever, is that we live in such a polarized world now that we say, well, we all have to be the same, and if you're not like me, then you're not a Christian. We say that. Now, now sometimes it sounds a little, a little silly. And hear me when I say this. There is absolutely nothing wrong if you have preferences. I mean, if you prefer to worship in a church with a full-robed choir, pipe organs, re, uh, recite the Apostles' Creed every Sunday, take communion every Sunday, that's fine. Or if you prefer to be in the basement of someone's house, in, in T-shirts, jeans, and flip-flops, all gathered around, just sort of having a good time. In the, that's fine. But the problem is when we say, no, no, I heard they took the organ out and put a drum kit in. I'm leaving because that ain't Christian. That's the problem. When it ain't like me, it's wrong. And that's what we've been sort of duped into believing. That, that, that as Christians, we all have to be not united but uniform. We have mistaken unity for uniformity. And we believe that we all must be the same. The same. And so when we read this passage from Jesus, which is a bit wordy, can we be honest? Jesus gets a little wordy in John. But here at the end, so that they may be one as we are one. We think that means... Jesus wants everybody to be the same. You know, if Jesus meant uniformity over unity, he'd have called 12 carpenters and they'd have formed a union, not 12 disciples and formed a movement. That's what would have happened. But he didn't. Oh, he's got some fishermen, some tax collectors, <laughs> some women, some people who've been sick. He's got them all in there. I want you to be one. And I tell you, to read that prayer today, that seems kind of hard. Because really, if you look around, everybody's arguing. Everybody is arguing. Everybody's saying, no, no, it's my way and you're wrong. Everybody. You can't, in, in religious publications, you can't open a magazine, you can't read an article. The Methodists are about to come off at the hinges. The Episcopals and the Anglicans, they don't get along. Catholics, some of the Catholics don't like the Pope. The Pope don't like some of the Catholics. And, and we don't even have to have a publication as Baptists. If we did, it might be called fractured. I don't know. There's so many splits and cracks all the way down. Depending on who you ask, some will say there are as many as over 30,000 different denominations in the world. And they're all just little differences here and little differences there. When we live in that sort of world and then read Jesus' prayer, I think we have a tendency to throw our hands up and go, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Just wait till he comes back and he'll straighten it all out. Wait till he comes back and Jesus will put it all back right. Everybody will, Jesus will straighten it out. He'll lay down the law. This is what you do. This is what you don't do. This is what you say. This is what you don't say. He'll come back and finish it, fix it. Until then, I'm just going to keep in my lane, doing my thing, doing what I want. It seems almost hopeless that Jesus' prayer would be reality. But can I tell you something? I have hope. I have hope that it's becoming reality. In spite of what the news tells you, in spite of what the world tells you, I have hope. Now, can I tell you why I have hope? Or would you rather not hear a word of hope this morning? Can I tell you why I have hope? Can, are you awake? Can I tell you why? Can I tell you why I have... Look, 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 look. Now, I'm going to step back a little. We can be... We, we can all pretend like it's not the summer. And just, but no, no. Do you want me to tell you why I have some hope? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I'll tell you why I have hope. Two days ago, two days ago, downtown in Jacksonville at the community center, we handed out our, our normal monthly food pantry. This happens every month. But it wasn't just 
folks that are in this room. No, no, we handed out food with people from the First Baptist Church of Jacksonville, Eastwood. Do you know what that church used to be called? The First Colored Baptist Church of Jacksonville. It was called that because First Baptist Jacksonville decided they didn't want non-whites coming to their church, so they built them their own church in Eastwood. And then here we are, First Baptist Williams, there, working hand in hand with the folks from First Baptist Eastwood. Do you know what their pastor's name is, by the way? It's Chris. We're pretty good friends. But it wasn't just two Baptists. There were Methodists there. Can you believe that? Methodists working with us. And then here's the other thing. Do you know the people who were coming to get food? They weren't just Baptists and Methodists. There were some Pentecostals, some Catholics, some unbelievers. Ooh. They were there coming to get food. I have hope. Can I tell you why else I have hope? Y'all haven't got it yet. Can I tell you why else I have hope? Yeah. Two days before that, sitting in downtown Anniston at a lunch table at a Thai place. If you like Thai food, it's pretty good. They're not, they didn't put an ad in the bulletin, so I won't tell you the name. Um, it's Thai on all, by the way. We're, I'm sitting at the table, sitting at the table. On my left, a Methodist minister about to change. The bishop played fruit basket turnover with some of them this year, about to leave. On my right, another Methodist pastor. Across the table from him, another Methodist. Across from me, an Episcopal priest, a woman. Next to her, another Episcopal priest. The Presbyterian couldn't make it. Looked like a bad bar joke. Presbyterians, Episcopals, and a Baptist walk into a Thai restaurant. But we sat at that table, and not once, not once did we argue about the proper mode of baptism. Not once did we bring up clauses in the Apostles' Creed and how our traditions had split from them. Do you know what we talked about? We talked about loss in each other's families. We talked about grieving together. We talked about the joys. And, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but we talked about the frustrations of being ministers. And we sat at that table and we ate. And we do that every month. Sometimes there's a Catholic, sometimes there's a Lutheran. You can tell the Lutheran because they'll order a tall beer at 11 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> but we all sit at the table. We all sit at the table. And there's no arguing and there's no division. Can I tell you why else I have hope? Yes. Now you're getting it. <laughs> Almost two weeks, two weeks ago tomorrow, I was in a theater in a, in a conference, convention center in San Antonio, Texas. 2,000 preachers. Now that's a terrible conference. 2,000 preachers in the same room. But we were from all over the world. All of us. We were all different denominations. There were Baptists, there were Methodists, Lutherans, Pentecostals, Catholics, some who didn't even know what they were. There were some who were, were lay people who were just charged with preaching. Some of us who had been to seminary, some with PhDs, some with GEDs. We were all in that room together. And we sang. We sang together. And at the end of the service, uh, the liturgist, that's the $5 word for music director, came to the podium. And he said, and now we will be served from the Lord's table. And sure enough, here came some ushers down to a table. They picked up a goblet. They picked up a plate. We were up in the balcony. I felt bad for him having to walk up those stairs. They came up. And he said, uh, and just so everyone can take, the, the wine is alcohol-free, non-alcoholic, and the wafers are gluten-free. And usually when someone says that, there's some kind of snarkiness. Oh, well, it's not the body and blood of Christ unless it's port and unleavened bread. Somebody will say, oh, gluten-free, grape juice, the Baptist must have had something to do with this. But no, you know what I heard? I didn't hear any of that. I heard the shuffle of feet. As people got up and began to line up in front of those with the cup and the plate. And then you know what I heard? All throughout that auditorium, some 2,000 people shuffling around. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. And then as we all shuffled back, we continued to sing. I have hope. I haven't given up on the church yet. 
I have hope. I have hope. Can I tell you one more reason why I have hope? Because in just a few days, about 15 of us are going to get in a van and a truck, and we're going to drive for an ungodly amount of time, and we're going to stop, and then we're going to drive for a little bit more to a place where it's hot, to a place where the people don't look like us, where they may speak a little differently from us. And then Sunday morning, a week from today, do you know what we're going to do? We're going to smile and nod as they sing in Spanish, and we don't know what they're saying. But we're going to worship. And we're going to work. And they're going to love us. And they're going to make us tamales. (laughs) Praise Jesus. And not once, not once, I hope, not once, I, I trust, not once, will there be a mention about anything they've seen on the news or anything we've seen on the news. But we will come together because we are all following the same shepherd. Now somebody will say, where's the line? You got to draw a line. Where's the line? You got to have a line. You know, you can't just let everybody, you got to have a line. Where do you draw it? Is it at worship style? Oh, I heard they wear jeans when they preach. No, they're not real. No. Where do you draw the line? Is it baptism? I heard they baptize babies. That's not really Christian. Where do you draw the line? Is it communion? I heard it's wine and they believe it's actually the blood of Jesus. Where do you draw the line? Is it at Orthodox Trinitarian theology? I don't know if most of us believe that or if we even know how to spell it. Where's the line? Where's the line, they say? I have to tell you, if I had to draw a line, it'd be a line with a bend in it. It'd be a circle. And it'd be an ever-widening circle. An ever-widening circle around the table. For it's there. It's there where Jesus drew the line. An ever-widening circle around all who would to come. You know, every time we take this meal together, do you know what I think? I think all of you are taking it with me. And then I think, you know, the Methodists in town, they might be taking communion right now too. The disciples in Anniston, they're taking it. The Catholics are taking it. Some church meeting under an overpass in Waco, Texas. They're taking it. Some church meeting under a shade tree in Ghana. They're taking it too. And the Amish might not, but we'll give them a pass. The Salvation Army might not, but we'll give them a pass. Because that circle goes ever wider and ever wider around the table of the Lord. And we are invited to take of it. And so in just a moment when you are served from the Lord's table, As you taste the bread, as you taste the cup, may in it you taste the fullness of God's fellowship and the call, that ever on call of being one with your brothers and sisters here and to the ends of the earth. And when you want to draw a line, put a little bend in it. And make it an ever-widening circle. For that's what God does. And thanks be to God that he does. Because otherwise, I'd be on the wrong side of the line. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, Have mercy on us, Lord, when we confuse uniformity for unity. When we confuse our preference for truth. Lord, when we seek to draw a line. Remind us, Lord, that you call all of us to be one. And that though we may disagree, though we may look through different glasses, God, that you still call us 
and you were calling us into that ever-widening circle around your table. So, Lord, at this time, may you bless this table. Bless this bread. Bless this cup, Lord. These powerful reminders, these symbols of our faith, these gifts that you give us, Lord, to remind us of your great love and sacrifice for us. May we take them, may they change us, may they call us, God, to also be symbols and gifts of your great power and love for all of us. Be with us now, Lord, as we are served from this table. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.